Great. Uh, thank, thanks very much, uh, Amelia, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go right into talking about how the city of Tucson has paid for solar. Uh, the city of Tucson started putting solar on city facilities back in 1999. Originally, we were funding solar directly out of the annual city budget using some money that unexpectedly appeared because of a rate freeze by our local utility company, which was then institutionalized, and we were able to install about 220 kilowatts on eight city sites um, over that 10-year period. Most of those were, were smaller sites, and we also leveraged money from some small grants as well as some utility rebates. That covered our first 10 years. Um, Tucson was lucky enough, along with San Jose and Milwaukee, to be designated by DOE as a, a Solar America City initially in 2007 and then again in 2009, which gave us access to some technical assistance. And one of the things that we were happy to get some help on was understanding how to uh, utilize clean renewable energy bonds or CREBs, which is the main thing I want to talk with you about today. We've basically done two rounds of CREBS projects. Our first CREBS projects were uh, part of a $7.6 million uh, package. CREBS are interest-free tax credit bonds. We uh, built these projects. Uh, for, they were completed in December of 2009 on seven sites. The city owns those projects and maintains, uh, has a maintenance contract for 10 years with the, the winning uh, bidder in that uh, first round. That was SPG Solar. The uh, total capacity was about one megawatt. We tried to use that, uh, that round of bonds both to get some larger scale solar projects on city of Tucson facilities as well as to demonstrate some new to Tucson solar technology. So we switched from uh, roof penetrating systems to ballasted systems. We installed some of the first solar trackers in town and many of you have heard of Solyndra in the last few months. We installed Solyndra panels on one of our buildings. We also monitor the, the same way that Amy was talking about. We've been using a system called Fat Spaniel, as well as having those, uh, having that solar data available online to the public. We also have several kiosks in public buildings which provide information about solar in general, as well as the specific output from our solar projects. Um, we liked our first round of CREBS projects so well that we applied for a second round of, uh, of CREBS money in 2009 and were awarded $14 million. We're ending up using about $11 million of that for our second phase of CREBS constructions, which this time we're doing about a 2 megawatt construction project. Uh, this time we're, we're continuing to do some city uh, roofs, including our convention center, but we've also moved into uh, doing quite a bit of solar shaded parking for police vehicles to, to try to preserve particularly the electronics in those vehicles in our, in our hot climate. And I should note that while there has not been any Krebs uh, funding available for the last few years, uh, I talked to the folks at IRS the other day, and it appears that there may be additional Krebs funds available in the fall of 2012 when unused Krebs dollars need to uh, to be returned. So I'm gonna, I want to take a few minutes on these next few slides and just sort of talk about the process and how this all works. So if this reallocation does uh, appear, people can figure out how to jump on it. Basically, the uh, IRS will announce the program, and you can see on this slide the, the top portion are things that are happening by uh, basically others, and the yellow on the bottom are things that uh, that we had to particularly do. So, uh, as the other speakers, as uh, as, as Amy and um, and Ashwini mentioned, uh, obviously selecting appropriate sites is hugely important. Um, I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But we had to select sites and identify sites and apply site by site for these Krebs bonds. Um, we had to let our mayor and council know what's going on. Um, we were lucky enough to get the allocation from the IRS, and then we went out with an RFP um, for, for installers, and 
we uh, at the same time were uh, also doing an RFP for bond placement, which we did. Our council approved the, the placement of the bond, and we were able to, to sell the bonds. In, in, each, uh, in each case, we sold them to Bank of America. We had several financial institutions involved in those uh, bidding on those bonds. Then we went ahead with the design and the construction. So overall, about a two-year process from beginning to end. Um, you've heard a little bit earlier about picking sites, and I just wanted to show you some specific examples. We had taken a look both at city buildings as well as ground locations, and here are two sites that we uh, looked at and decided to utilize in our first round of the, of the Krebs grants. The first one was this very large, beautiful solar flat roof that you see on the upper slide. This is a neighborhood activity center with a gymnasium and some other facilities. But in my view, this is almost a perfect solar site. The roof was in good condition. The building gets a lot of use due to the gymnasium in the neighborhood. It's not going anywhere. There's no shading of trees or anything else to the south. There's no uh, HVAC equipment or other problems with the roof. So it's really a, and the electrical, uh, there's electrical capacity in the panel. So it's really what I call a, a basically a perfect solar roof situation. And the lower uh, picture is uh, an area of ground that we had near uh, a reservoir that also is pretty much perfect. It's right next to uh, to an electrical substation where we could tie in. Uh, there's a large load because there's water pumping going on there, and it's also a great place. So we went through the same kind of analysis that you've heard about before. We took a look at all the items on this list. A couple of things that haven't been mentioned. Uh, we had to deal with uh, access to roof issues in some situations. We had to build additional um, stairway access or ladder access to the roof for maintenance purposes. We had to deal with some potential vandalism issues, and you'll see what we had to do for a pigeon abatement. Of course, it's important to uh, be uh, familiar with your local electric power company requirements to make sure there's no snags on the interconnection and decide if you need to upgrade your electrical service and then deal with any kind of special permits that may be required, for, particularly for ground mounts. For example, in Tucson, we have special native plant requirements that, that we had to follow in doing those installations. Um, and it's important to remember that in addition to the cost you're thinking about, of course, to hang on to some additional money for additional contingencies. Well, obviously the big question is any time you're doing a bond, how do you pay it back? So the, the primary uh, issue that, that we had was our mayor and council said, well, all the solar stuff is great, but these big projects cost a substantial amount of money, and we're not going to put any uh, or very much general fund money into it. So what can you do? So basically what we did was created an internal, what we called an internal service fund, and since these solar projects have been installed, what we've done is we've charged the, the department, city department in each of these buildings for the electricity generated by the solar panels at the same rate that they would have paid for electricity from the utility company, and we sold the RECs, the renewable energy credits, to our local utility company. And the business case we presented was that uh, our, we were going to be cash positive in the first year, and uh, we were able contractually to uh, to have guaranteed production, so we knew how much we were going to get out of it. So that, that excuse me, that ground site you were looking at next to the reservoir originally was a piece of ground, and now it looks like this. This is the uh, 220 kilowatt system on trackers that you can see here that we installed on that piece of open ground I showed you. And this is what we did with that big roof. You might note the chicken wire, which we had to put in to keep pigeons from roosting under the solar panels, but that, that beautiful roof is now 100% covered with solar panels. And here's the recently off malign cylinder panels that were actually a successful project for us because we had a building that had very little structural integrity in the roof, we learned, uh, from a structural engineer, but it was able to support these lightweight cylinder panels and they have been performing perfectly fine. You heard discussion earlier about PPA, Power Purchase Agreement. This slide basically compares the two. Um, essentially, using the Krebs model, we are the owners of, the, uh, of these solar projects. We're not simply purchasing power, although we have another project where we are using a PPA to, uh, to provide solar energy to us. But the primary thing, um, I think, is 
who's responsible for operation and maintenance, and we solved that problem, we believe, by having a long-term O&M contract with our installer. This, uh, this graphic here really sort of summarizes what we think are the, the key pieces to having a, a successful project, most of which I've uh, already talked about. And I think this is uh, a, a, the combination of all of these made the project a success. No, no one of them was the key thing, but without any of them, potentially, we would have had problems. So the main lessons learned, similar to what you've heard earlier, uh, most important, planning for O&M, having a clear plan for, uh, for, for payback, timing the bond issuance to catch the market properly, and be sure to involve the residents of the building in your plans. I also wanted to take a few minutes and talk about some other ways that, that the city of Tucson has used to pay for solar because these Krebs uh, allocations only have come around twice, and <clears throat> we want to do solar other times. So the city of Tucson now has a requirement that all new city-funded buildings must meet 5% of their energy load through some sort of solar, which can be daylighting, solar water heating, or photovoltaics. This is a city garage that was built about five years ago. And on the, the right side, you can see we've got a 60-kilowatt solar array on the top of that building. So you could include solar as a requirement for new buildings and just build it into your construction budget. We also have over 300 um, bus shelters. And these are funded solely by the advertising on the bus shelters. An ad agency pays the city for the right to advertise, and uh, that covers the cost of installing and maintaining the solar, which covers the safety lights inside the shelter, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to also put up LED signs telling uh, the bus riders when the next bus is coming. The uh, one other way to, to generate some money if you have some land is we recently have uh, leased land on two very large sites for, for wholesale projects, solar farms, um, that are being done in connection with our local utility company. And there was some city land that was not being used that we've leased for these solar farms, and we're generating a um, substantial amount of money as lease payments, which we're hoping we can turn around and use for additional solar projects. And finally, I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't mention um, the, the fact that uh, we just completed one project that was funded through a source that may not be very likely available in the future, but Representative Gabby Giffords, who many of you have heard about in the news the past few days, was successful in getting us funding for a congressionally directed project where funding um, through that con special congressional appropriation was used to, to build a project at a local library and police station. So we're always looking for different ways to, to fund solar, and we feel like we've used quite a few um, over the 12 years that we've been doing solar, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of you might have. And thank you for attending, and good luck on your projects. Let me turn it back over to Amelia for questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bruce. And I do want to uh, go ahead and jump right into questions. But first, first I just want to remind everybody, um, you do have two options to ask questions today. You can either go to the upper left-hand corner and click on Q&A and type your questions in, or if you'd like to come live over the phone line and ask a question, uh, you can go ahead and press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Again, that's star 1, and that'll put you into the queue, and then I'll let you know when your individual line is live. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start taking some questions. I'm going to hand it over to Grant from ITMA. Thanks, Amelia. And our first question, do any of your cities require that city-constructed buildings achieve LEED certification? Uh, this is Bruce, so maybe I can start with that. Um, in Tucson, we require all city-funded buildings to meet LEED Silver, but frankly, we decided we were not satisfied with only meeting LEED Silver, so, and it, because as you uh, undoubtedly know, you can obtain a LEED rating without doing much of any solar. So, particularly in Arizona, we want to, to make sure that we did get some solar on buildings, so we have a lead silver requirement as well as our 5% solar question. Okay, great. And we have a question in the queue, so I'm going to bring this person live next. Uh, caller, go ahead. Your line is now live. A general question uh, about the, how much the um, utilities were giving you for that wholesale power you say you were selling back to them. So. 
Well, I'll give that a start. Um, a start. In Tucson, um, we're able to uh, participate in an auction. The, the way that Arizona works in terms of utility rebates is we have both net metering, so we're reducing our power bill through the uh, amount of solar energy, solar electricity that we're generating, so our bill is being reduced, and we were able to successfully bid in at the auction. They have an auction process here to uh, to allocate the uh, limited amount of utility rebates. At the time we did these projects, we were lucky to um, to get uh, in at 16 cents per kilowatt hour. So every kilowatt hour that we generate, we get paid uh, 16 cents for that kilowatt hour. Those numbers have drastically dropped in Arizona in the past few years, and now they're in the six, seven cent range. If we were doing a new a new project, um, but the uh, that auction process determines in, in our state the amount that, that you get. We send, we basically keep track of the uh, of the amount of power that we generate through our monitoring system, and um, the utility sends us a check. Um, each quarter you know, to pay us for the amount of solar that, that we generate and feed into uh, into the grid. Thank you, Bruce. And the next question we have, do either of you recommend the use of a consultant to assist city staff at the front end of this to navigate through the process, develop options, site assessment, develop goals, et cetera? Um, this is Ashwini, and I'll just take a first pass at it. So I think our staff has done so much work, internal city staff has done so much work through kind of the process and the different RFPs that at this point we don't see uh, the value in getting a consultant to help us walk through the steps. But somebody who who is just approaching this for the first time, yes, there is there's such a multitude of issues that it may be helpful to get somebody who's familiar with them and will help you navigate them. And this is Amy. I'll jump in. I, w I would echo the, the same thought of if you're just starting, if you're maybe doing one project or two projects that as much as we, I'm sure, all love the term consultant, um, and from, from a city staff perspective, um, it, it may be helpful simply because you don't have the, the time or that, or that background knowledge to deal with issues ranging from the technical side of a solar site assessment even to the financial and legal issues of a PPA, but especially if you're going down the path of a leasing arrangement or a PPA, um, those are pretty technical and it would it I would recommend getting a consultant. One of the things we ended up doing is our city staff um one of our city staff members in our Department of Public Works has been really interested in solar and so knowing we're going to rank our sites based on the on the on the on its solar capacity, they're actually trained in doing solar site assessments. So we do not have to issue contracts to have somebody to pay somebody to evaluate the shading issues and that sort of thing. We'll have a city staff person do that. I, I pretty much agree with that. If you have trained staff to do it, it's great. We've used um, some DOE consultants to help us through our Solar America Communities program, and we've also used the same approach that was already mentioned um, earlier by I forget if it was if it was Amy or or, or Ash we need to have the uh, people that are bidding on a contract starting with qualifications to um, have them do the bulk of the work for the final assessments of buildings just to confirm what uh, what, you, what you've already determined in the preliminary run through. Okay, great, and we're going to bring another person live for our question next. So, caller, go ahead. Your line is now live. Yes, hi. Um, I'm curious in San Jose where you're using a third party um, and entering into a power purchase agreement, whether you know whether the third party was um, able to take advantage of both the investment tax credit and the accelerated depreciation. Um, I have heard that if you're using a municipal um, or otherwise publicly owned asset, um, you have to choose one or the other of those two really great financial ad advantages. Is that true? Hi. Uh, so this is Ashwini. And uh, from what I know, they were able to take advantage of both, but um, 
I can, if you want to contact me offline, I can confirm that. I know for sure they're taking advantage of the investment tax credit. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we go to this PPA option. Right. Uh, that, that pencils out. I know that the recent RFP that we entered into for the new facilities, they were looking into the depreciation. I'm not sure if they're able to use it or not. We're just getting started on the new facilities, um, the 28 facilities that we talked about with Solar City. Right. Okay. This is Bruce from Tucson. My understanding is that there is not a prohibition to using both, and that's one of the ways that uh, the leasing companies have been really moving ahead very, very rapidly is by taking advantage of all those. Yeah. Good. I'm glad that's just a rumor. <laughs> okay, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, are you aware of any municipal solar installations that have been located on top of closed landfills? Is this feasible? Uh, this is Bruce. I'll take a quick step at that. San Antonio has done that, and uh, they, they have some interesting information, I believe, still on their website about doing that. Uh, we just received, the city of Tucson just received a, a grant from EPA and NREL to study feasibility of closed landfills for uh, for solar application, and uh, we believe those are exceptionally good locations for solar because they often have uh, power lines nearby, and the, uh, uh, the, the technical issues seem to have been pretty much resolved for many landfills, so I think those are often excellent sites, and I would certainly encourage people to take a look at the San Jose example, and there are probably others that I'm, that I'm not aware of. And um, if you get back with me in six months, I'll tell you what the NRL folks said about our closed landfills in Tucson that we're hoping to be using for solar within the year. Um, this is actually just to add to that. In San Jose, we have a couple of landfills that we did a very preliminary analysis. Um, so it was possible to do it, but it, it just didn't pencil out financially. So we didn't proceed with it at that point. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much to all of you uh, for answering those questions. Uh, and on behalf of ICMA, I'd now like to thank the audience for joining us today and for your participation. And I also just want to give a big thank you to our three speakers for your excellent presentations today.